I am, I'm Luann McGovern and I'm on the board of the Conservancy and I'm also a chemical engineer, so but I'm not gonna talk very chemical engineering right now, just a really high level overview of PFAS or PFAs. Um, so PFAS is a, thousands of different chemicals, um, basically per fluoro alcohol and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Lots and lots of different combinations, and you probably, you most likely maybe have something on your body right now that could potentially have PFAS in it, <laughs> if you have any waterproof clothing on. Um, they're called forever chemicals because they really don't naturally break down. They have very strong uh, carbon fluorine bonds, and so once they're in the environment, they're pretty much in the environment forever, and that's why they're called forever <coughs> chemicals. Um, just if you're, you know, general formula. It's just basically carbon and fluorine at different combinations. Um, why do we care? Well, there's been a lot of studies around PFAS lately that there's a lot of health impacts. Um, it could have uh, impacts on your liver, on your thyroid, uh, immune system, uh, could be cancer causing. A lot of different things that are showing at different levels. PFAS can be very uh, compromising to the human body. Unfortunately, uh, studies are showing that you know, PFAS chemicals are everywhere. And uh, I'll show a slide on where they found it in the waters of West Virginia. And um, they're also finding that PFAS is uh, pretty much ubiquitous in our own bodies too, um, because we're exposed to them in so many different ways from so many different sources. So I thought this was a great graphic to show, you know, wh where do these things come from? Well, they come from all over the place. And um, I pointed out a few, what I would consider um, brand names that you probably know, of where PFAS, okay? I'd say most of the people in this room probably own or own something that has Gore-Tex. We love our waterproof <coughs> clothing, right? Gore-Tex is PFAS. I mean, it, it just, it is. I mean, there's no way around it. Um, we all grew up with Teflon pans, most of us probably, unless we used cast iron our whole life. Um, but uh, Teflon, uh, if you're familiar with um, all of the issues around DuPont and the Parkersburg area, if you saw the movie Dark Waters, um, that's, you know, manufacturing of Teflon, basically. Uh, Scotchgard, you know, the stuff that's on carpeting and uh, furniture to keep it stain resistant, you know, that's, that's a PFAS compound. Um, Another one that's uh, a big source of uh, PFAS in communities is uh, firefighting foams. So uh, they found that by adding PFAS to certain firefighting foams uh, is very effective at suppressing uh, liquid fires uh, because it has a surfactant pro property which will suffocate the fire in a liquid fire. So a lot of uh, firefighters were using this foam or practicing with this foam it then went into the sewers, into the waterways, and a, a, a really big source in some areas of PFAS in uh, municipal water systems. So you can see, pick, pick, a, pick a category, you've probably got PFAS in your life pretty ubiquitously. Um, this is kind of a, a really busy slide, but I thought it was a good il illustration to show all the different ways that that PFAS has gotten into the water systems, whether it be, you know, directly, oh, sorry, wrong button, directly from PFAS producing industries such as DuPont and 3M and their, and their factories and, and discharging uh, to the waste water systems. Uh, landfills, I think, is a big uh, source of PFAS into water systems where the leachate is not controlled properly. That leachate then goes into the water systems, the, um, through the wastewater treatment plant or directly uh, into local waters, into the rivers and into the groundwater. Um, <clears throat> another area is uh, wastewater treatment biosolids. Uh, a lot of farmers take biosolids from wastewater treatment plants and apply them to their ground. And we were talking about this at lunch, that even organic farms who think, oh, I've got an organic farm, it's all good, but maybe the prior owner put biosolids on their land and it has PFAS in it and it's never going away. So um, lots of different ways. And then of course, in, uh, in residential homes, say you have that waterproof clothing and you wash it or you um, in your washing machine and it goes into the sewer system and it goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And there it is, you know, why does your, 
your waterproof clothing no longer waterproof because you've leached all the PFAS out of it. I don't know, it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, I won't go <laughs> in deep on this, but there has been quite a bit of work on this, and I, and I see Angie Rosser in the back there, and she maybe is going to talk about this. So um, in February of 2020, believe it or not, there was a Senate concurrent resolution uh, to uh, study PFAS at, at public water systems. And it was, a study was conducted by the U.S. Geological Survey, and the, re the report was issued. It's available. Um, in the meantime, the EPA um, issued revised health advisories for selected PFAS chemicals. And as you can see, they're saying there's no safe level, basically, of PFAS. <laughs> those, le those numbers are so small, they're not even hardly detectable. Um, the study was released in July of 2022 that showed that over 130 water systems statewide uh, do have detectable levels of PFAS. Uh, and I have the graphic on the second slide, next slide. And uh, in March of this past year, through a lot of great work, there was a bipartisan resolution to um, uh, House Bill 3189 to take the next step to say, what do we do now? And so they have directed um, the agencies to come up with uh, action plans to identify where are the sources of the PFAS, where we see elevated levels, and uh, develop action plans. And the first 50 sets of action plans are due by the end of 2025. So um, hopefully, and Angie probably knows, hopefully they're gonna go from the worst to the least, but I don't know if that's the way the government actually works. She's shaking her head yes. So um, certainly, uh, if you look at the map, and I stole this directly from West Virginia River's uh, webpage, uh, you can see where the concentration of the worst PFAS contaminations are uh, in West Virginia. Uh, obviously, this area along the Ohio River is greatly impacted by uh, the manufacturing facilities that have traditionally been in that area. And then uh, there's a large concentration uh, in the eastern panhandle. But you'll also see this little one right here. Let's see if I can, right there? Yeah. That's Davis. <laughs> so it's, it's everywhere. I mean, it, the one that surprises me is I live in Kanawha County in Charleston, which was the center of the chemical industry for years and years. And there's only, I'm not even sure that one is actually in Kanawha County. But Kanawha County, none of PFAS manufacturing was never it, you know, a part of the industry in Kanawha County. So that's just a really quick high overview about PFAS um, and uh, why it's such an issue for um, not just the state of West Virginia, but the, the entire country. Again, I'm uh, Mike Hironic with the West Virginia Bird for Public Health out of the Fairmont District Office. We cover 14 counties and Tucker is one of them. And I've been doing this job for about uh, 20 some years and and it's good to be up, up in this area. What I primarily focus on is uh, inspecting surface water plants or any public water system. And this is just a breakdown of what we're looking at in, in talking about small plants. Uh, there's only 11 large plants that have, uh, that go 24 seven. And that's Charleston, Huntington, Beckley, Clarksburg, Fairmont, Morgantown, those kind of large systems. Uh, but when you go down and see how many uh, small systems there are, there's 65 of the 116 systems only have one or two filters. So that's very small. Isolated areas in West Virginia, they've got to have their own plants. And uh, kind of getting off topic. So what we do is, is we rank those who are the best performing and the worst performing. But I don't want to go there. What I want to do is see if I can pull up this YouTube from Mitch. That's, that's old stuff. That's a year and a half old. What has happened since then is, well, let's check those sources that we did get DTEX and see, uh, see what the finished water is doing. Okay. And that's why I said, yeah, there's a work group that's talking uh, mostly along the Ohio River and in Martinsburg area. This is uh, on our website where we've got the finished water 
and, and the raw water test results at. You've got to go to a key link to come up with the uh, location, but all the data is there. Um, kind of really interesting stuff, though. They won surprises in, I think it's in Marshall County, it's New Martinsville. It's getting a lot of DTECs on the UMCR 5, Unregulated Container Mo Monitoring Rule 5. Uh, but, uh, and then this is the report that uh, Mitch was referring to. It came out, uh, like I said, maybe a year and a half ago. Since then, uh, so I call that round one, where they looked at 279 sources, uh, child cares. Uh, lithium is not really talked about, but there's 70 techs on it. Looks, you know, you just Google it and you think, okay, that's the batteries. If you're, if you got batteries in landfills, and uh, I think the MCL is somewhere near 50, but it's not really being talked about because PFOS is getting all the attention, as it should be. And uh, finished water, there's a work group with 70, 37 public water systems with. Above a four is where they came because that's where it's, the reliable concentration is. You can, uh, you can have an asterisk, which is a, a J that it's reportable, but it's not accurate below four. Looking at some of the USGS data, uh, they're down into the one and two parts per trillion range. And uh, the raw water was really interesting because they, they did a lot of other parameters. The second time around for the finished water, not so. This is also on our website. Uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs is Martinsburg's uh, surface water plant. So they've got a PFOS problem. Going from 70 to four or the minimum detection limit. Will that change? I, I don't know. And I can only comp, uh, talk about it. Uh, 37 DTECs were above four. So 13% of the uh, public water sources tested or systems, finished water, showed up on that. Does that mean, uh, and, and you gotta realize, there's only two data points on this. So you, know, you may show up later, you may not. We don't have enough data yet, as I think it's all agreed upon. And then Lubeck is really interesting because we have visited there not too long ago. And uh, they have treatment in place, which is uh, four GAC filters. Once they get DTECs on one of the filters, they take it out of service, put the second one in, and put media in the third, uh, in the replaced media. Uh, are they paying for that? No. Uh, DuPont Washington Works or Chemours is doing that for the last, gosh, uh, decade. And talking to them, what has changed in the raw water uh, concentrations? No, it hasn't changed a, a lot. And they use uh, at least a half a million a, a month or produce to their customers. If you look on their website, there's some surprising things on there. Williamstown Water is along the, just north of Parkersburg. Shenandoah Mini Homes is a mobile home park. Uh, this should be UMCR5 results that we just queried these uh, last week. So this is the science project that says in the next three years we want to quantify what's going on for uh, lithium and uh, 29 PFOS components. So we should have 30, uh, 3,000, 4,000 data points by the end of this year. We've got 65% of them in this year, and so far, um, I think we have eight or nine uh, DTECs. New Martinsville being prevalent, uh, a couple of higher ones. If they're close to the, uh, the four, which is the proposed MCL on a running annual average, quarterly running annual average, then uh, I think there's a lot of interferences that can happen. Uh, if you wear deodorant, you can, you can have a interference. When Mitch was sampling at Beelington uh, for, the, for the raw sample, uh, they had folks with the uh, white Tyvek suits on, and uh, we're, we are sampling with the UMCR5 stuff, and uh, he went back and took a finished water sample, and I'm, I'm talking to him, and he, he's just double gloving it. Um, and he is on his way to Davis the next day, and to uh, they also got a raw water hit at, what is it, Mountaintop in, in Grant County. Uh, that, that should be in the finished water data from the second round. 
and we're shipping things for UMCR5 to uh, California. Not too many labs are doing this, uh, very, very few, and, and, uh, uh, we, and we just got two short hits in, uh, in finished water in Hurricane and Short Line PSD is, is a purchasing agent from Clarksburg. So that's uh, the third sample that, that was sampled there and the first detect. But these numbers are appropriate, uh, approximate. We're looking at some of the results and oh, they, they're doing more than uh, 29 PFOS components. And that's about all I have as far as update. The, the, the uh, round three of the finished water sampling will go back and look at some of this same, uh, same places where you suspect DTECs or you got something before that was between the reporting limit and the minimum detection limit. And uh, that should start as early as this month, but I think uh, that's, that's, uh, uh, that may or may not happen. And USGS is gonna be doing that sampling too. Uh, but if you're curious about water, here's some other good books. Amenity and Prosperity was uh, the thing that Bob Smith's uh, bar brother and sister-in-law are in. It's about fracking, and it's a Pulitzer Prize winning thing. And then uh, the high on our priority is, is lead and copper. And a lot of the water systems are uh, getting ready to do that uh, or to go into the next rule that kicks in October next year. You're, or you're away from that and working with Clarksburg a lot on that. Uh, but with this, I'll turn it over to uh, Corey, who is uh, a chief operator at Beverly, but he works primarily for the Rural Water uh, Association and does the apprenticeship program there and is on the board of uh, Hudsonville PSD in Randolph County. Corey? When I was chief operator at Beverly, Mitch actually came and sampled in 2019, I think. And they actually put like, like they took plastic and covered everything, the sinks and everything. And they was real precise on sampling. Don't worry about interference. Uh, yeah, they, there's no interference. Like it was, they got strictly the water that they wanted. There was no type of interferences. Um, as far as like treatment processes to take the PFOS out, the only thing really right now that is in progress that I know of is the granular activated carbon filters at Lubeck, right? I'm pretty sure. And I guess, and now the question's coming up is they're putting, they're doing all of this filtering and then they're going to have to do more treatment, but then you're concentrating the PFOS into the media or whatever type of filtration you're going to use. Well, where's that going to go once it's, you know, concentrated? <clears throat> now they're looking at like incinerators up at 3,000 degrees to dump that stuff in to burn it off. But well, it's. They're, it's heat resistant, but they said like 3,000 degrees or above will take it completely out. 